Right, so um, if you click to the next slide, <laughs> perfect. Yeah, so if you look at ice sheet dynamics, it's always a large scale problem. So it's about a couple of million square kilometers that you have to tackle and in the vertical direction, it's dealing with kind of thousands of meters. And basically it is um, nothing else than gravity driven lubricated flow and it organizes in these, like you have it in watersheds or so, you have drainage basins. And the big issue that we have, it is not only gravity driven, but it is lubricated gravity driven flow. So we have sliding across the base due to some melt water that is arising at the base of the ice sheet. And indications are this is a non-linear sliding law, otherwise it would be boring. And it's a thermal mechanically coupled problem, meaning our viscosity is non-linear, and it's non-linear and strain thinning, and the ratio of the viscosities over the vertical is up to two, a factor of 2,000. So it's warm at the base, it's cold in the middle and at the top. So this makes it um, particularly tricky, and um, in addition to that, or as a result, this system forms, we have these Earth system forcings, like we have the atmosphere at the surface, the lithospheric forcing giving us a geothermal heat flux into the ice, and of course at the ocean, at the area where they are starting to float, we have this oceanic forcing. And in the ideal world, in future, we may consider to couple other models, like the lithosphere model that kind of simulates the glacial isostatic adjustments with precise to an ice sheet model. We could, I think, an ocean model should be coupled to precise because basically it is a fluid structure interaction, although the structure is relatively solid and a fluid in its nature. And with the atmosphere, there are these regional climate models that's anyway somehow tricky. But that's the kind of idea behind. And if you look into the detail, of course, it's a continuum mechanical approach. And we solve balance equations for mass, momentum, and enthalpy. And then these atmospheric forcing, lithospheric forcing, and so on, they either go directly in the term into these basal, uh, into the balance equations, or they influence the boundary conditions. And we glaciologists tend to call these things like processes like you have heard in the talk before about the deformation of the solid. So we are simulating a creep, then we have the sliding law, and then the mainly unknown good calving law. And this is where Daniel's project is also setting in. And one of our main issues is that we have to have a good state of the ice sheet today to make decent projections of the sea level. That's on the next slide. There are two strategies. Either you run paleo spin up, so simulating 200,000 of years in a poor resolution with very limited physics, and you end up with an ice sheet that does not look like the ice sheets are looking today, but you have a good temperature field, or you are employing inverse methods, and then you end up with a good looking ice sheet of today, but by far too warm. And we have developed methods to tackle that a bit, but what we hope for is if we use more satellite data to force the system into a stress state that is close to present day stress state, that we can avoid all these things that we normally have to deal with when going over from the spin up towards a projection. And that's exactly where Daniel's Okay, now it's on. Um, yo, so now you know about as much as me. Um, okay, so this is, uh, uh, we're going to talk about carving fronts now. Um, this is uh, Jakob Schaun Glacier, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, in Greenland. Um, this here is the, uh, does the mouse work? No, I don't think so. Okay, so the, the, the arc in the middle that you can see is the uh, front of the glacier. And as you can see from the uh, debris in front, there's constantly um, large and small pieces breaking off. And this process is called carving. Um, because of the carving and because of uh, melting of the ice and because of the forward movement, uh, 
the front of the glacier is constantly changing position. So it moves forward and backward. Um, and if you want to model the ice correctly, um, you need to keep track of the front of the, uh, the position of the front during the simulation. And yeah, this is what we are working on in our uh, project. Um, we are developing a new um, front tracking code. Um, and we want to couple this with a uh, large um, ice shield uh, simulation software called ISSM. The core of the project is a new um, approach to model uh, carving fronts. Uh, we want to um, extract the position of fronts of the front from uh, satellite images um, using machine learning, and then uh, solve an inverse problem to commute the, co compute the um, ablation rate, that is the combined um, melting and carving rate. Um, the project is in a very early stage. Um, like the, the machine learning is very far along, so that's uh, already pretty, uh, pretty far. Um, we are working on a, a prototype for the front tracking code right now and for the um, coupling uh, for the precise adapter for this. Um, there's also a precise adapter for ISM in development, which uh, Yannick will talk about uh, in a few minutes. So, um, Right, let's get into it. First, uh, the ice shield uh, simulation soft uh, code, um, ISSM. Um, as uh, Angelika just uh, mentioned, uh, ice is uh, quite a complex system. Um, so ISSM is, has to solve uh, multiple uh, problems and uh, does this in uh, so-called so cores. Um, so we have a, a therm thermal core, which does um, uh, temperatures, and we have a, a stress balance core which handles the, the stresses in the ice and um, the velocity. And we also have a, already a, a moving front core which does front tracking, um, but we want to uh, replace this with our own external code for reasons that I will uh, get to. Um, it solves all these uh, problems with, um, these are all uh, partial differential equations, and it solves all of them with um, a finite element method. Uh, some of them are three-dimensional, so uh, thermal and stress balance um, are done all over the volume of the ice, so in three dimensions. Um, some others, like the front tracking, is done in, in uh, two dimensions. The uh, three-dimensional mesh is derived from the two-dimensional mesh by extrusion, so it's just basically copies of the two-dimensional mesh in a uh, vertical direction. Um, yeah, using ISSM you can do uh, continental scale simulations, so it's very large scales. Um, for example, you can do, as in, as in the picture, um, the, these are the ice velocities of the uh, Greenland, whole Greenland ice sheet uh, to a very fine uh, resolution uh, computed using ISSM. Okay, so uh, why do we want to replace uh, this uh, moving front core? Um, this was a, a scaling analysis that was done by Yannick um, of uh, ISSM. It shows the runtime of uh, ISSM and the different cores with um, increasing number of processes. The uh, top uh, line, the, the red line on top, is the uh, combined runtime, so all of ISSM, like a single iteration of ISSM. Um, the line right below it, the pink line, um, is the, uh, the stress balance core, which is the most expensive part. Um, it's, as I said, it's uh, three-dimensional. It's also non-linear, so that's why it takes most of the time. Um, but being 3D, it's three-dimensional, it also scales quite well up to a high number of processes. The uh, black line is the... Uh, moving front core, and as you can see, it only scales up to uh, about 1,500 MPI processes. Um, and uh, at some point, it actually overtakes uh, the um, stress balance core. So uh, this is like the, the major bottleneck for scaling in ISSM, the moving front core. Other cores, like the green line, the mass transport core, also uh, don't scale very well, but they are much smaller part of ISM, so they are less, less of a problem. 
So this is then the uh, first reason why we want to replace the moving front core. It, um, having an external code gives us more flexibility to use uh, different meshes or different uh, decompositions, different numbers of uh, MPI processes for the different uh, uh, solvers. Um, the second reason is to uh, improve the modeling. Um, this is what Angelica just expla <laughs> explained with the uh, carving law. Right now, um, ISSM only supports continuous carving rates, but pieces breaking off from the ice is a discontinuous process. Sometimes these pieces are very large, uh, and we want to be able to model this. And the uh, third reason is modularity. Um, we want to be able to use the same front tracking code for other applications as well. Okay, so then gets, let's get to uh, the front tracking. Um, for tracking the, the, the front, we are using what's called the level set method. Um, in this method, you don't have, a, have an explicit representation of the, uh, of the front, um, like a spline or something like that. Instead, you're, you're uh, representing it implicitly. Um, we have what's called a signed distance function. Um, as you can see in the, in the image, it has a value that increases with the distance from the front. And we have a negative value where there is ice, and we have positive value where there is no ice. Um, and where the, where the value is of, the, of, this, uh, uh, of the signed distance function is zero is, exact, is the front. Um, and then the, the movement of the front is a simple transport equation. Um, in the transport equation, of course, there's this uh, parameter W, which is uh, the velocity field. Uh, for ice, this would be a combination of the horizontal velocity of the ice, so that's the forward movement uh, of a glacier, for example, and um, then melting and carving rate, uh, which are defined in uh, normal direction to the front. There are uh, different ways to derive the uh, melting and carving rate. Um, one way is using uh, physics. For example, you can derive the carving rate uh, using um, uh, von Mises stresses from structural mechanics. The problem with this is that uh, it only uh, works um, continuous at large scales. Um, you can do si single um, carving events, so discontinuous processes uh, with uh, structural mechanics, but th this uh, is too expensive for uh, continental scales. And, and of course, you can do similar physics uh, things for uh, the uh, melting rate. Um, so our approach is uh, to use uh, um, satellite images, as I uh, said before. Um, our uh, collaborator from um, uh, the German Aerospace Center has um, uh, trained a uh, deep neural network to extract um, the um, fronts uh, from satellite images. And then we get a nice uh, time series of uh, front positions, as you can see in the, in the, in the image. Um, and then we can run an inverse level set problem to compute the uh, melting and carving rate. And we hope to be able to do this uh, to model uh, discontinuous carving at uh, large scales with this. So uh, this is then the, um, our setup for the coupling. We have on the one hand, on the one side, um, ISSM, which is the ice shield model. It's a three-dimensional finite element code, and it provides uh, the physical um, variables that we need. So temperatures, velocities of you know, the ice, uh, von Mises stresses, um, what the variables exactly that we need depend on the carving law that we try to uh, replicate. Um, yeah, so on, and on the other hand, we have the front tracking code, which is two-dimensional, and we are going to use a finite difference method uh, to um, solve the transport equation. And this will then provide the uh, level set function, so this is the implicit representation of the um, of the front to ISSM, um, and ISSM can compute can compute from this a mask of elements, so uh, which element is covered by ice and which element is ice free, so it only really needs the uh, sign of the uh, distance function. 
Okay, um, right, for the coupling, uh, we have a couple of things that we need to consider, as we've seen uh, yesterday in the, uh, in the uh, courses as well. Um, first thing to uh, think about is the, the meshes and the coupling interface. Um, we have a, a volume coupling, um, because it both the uh, both ISM and front tracking cover the same uh, two-dimensional area. Um, ISSM, of course, is uh, three-dimensional uh, mostly, um, but uh, as I said before, the three-dimensional mesh is just an extrusion of the two-dimensional mesh, so it's easy to average this to get uh, two-dimensional variables. Um, ISSM has a, a unstructured um, unstructured mesh and it's uh, completely static, so it does not support any uh, adaptive, uh, dynamic adaptive meshes. Um, right, and the uh, front tracking code can just use a regular uh, mesh for um, the finite difference method, um, at least initially we have a few optimizations. Um, yeah, uh, right. The first optimization that, that we want to do is um, the uh, level set problem really only needs to be solved close to the front. Um, areas that are far away from the front uh, don't really matter. Um, so um, we can reduce the solver to a, to a band around the front. Um, this reduces the cost for the solver. Um, we would still couple the whole two-dimensional region, um, but, we only, but we only update vertices inside of the band. Um, and then when the front moves around, of course we need to uh, move the band around with it. Um, it could look, uh, for example, like this. Um, the first time step, uh, we would update uh, the uh, vertices highlighted in, in red and the others uh, are just ignored. Um, right, and then the second time step, the front has moved, moved around a bit, so we update a different uh, set of vertices. Um, how many vertices? we need to update depends on the discretization. So we have a very wide um, high order stencil for the finite differences. We need to uh, use a very wide band to uh, cover that correctly. Otherwise we uh, run into the uh, edges of the band. Um, yeah, the second optimization that we want to do is to, uh, to use adaptive meshes, uh, a dynamically adapted mesh for the um, finite difference method for the uh, front tracking code. Um, we want to uh, use uh, the um, TED code uh, library, which uh, is developed by our uh, colleagues at uh, DLR um, for managing the um, re uh, refined mesh. Um, so we can have a, a finer mesh in areas where there's a very complex front with uh, great curvature. Um, I think, if I understood correctly, uh, support for um, adaptive meshes to precise is coming uh, in development. So uh, we hope to be to be able to use that. Right now, you would have to restart precise with with the adapted mesh, um, and this would be very expensive because ISM is uh, expensive to start to start up. Um, okay, um, this is uh, the meshes. Um, the Second thing to consider are the variables and how to map them. This is fairly straightforward, I think. Um, all the variables are consistent uh, instead of conservative, so this affects in a parallel coupling at least um, which participant needs to do the uh, mapping. Um, we want to use a linear cell interpolation. We, we, have, we have volume coupling, so this uh, seems to be the um, proper choice, although I haven't looked into the uh, radial basis functions yet. Um, maybe that would work as well um, and uh, better, but I probably don't need very high order for that. Um, right, and the, the prototype we are currently developing just uses nearest neighbor for simplicity. Most of the variables can be just read from input data, so we can just put them into both systems uh, independently. Some of the variables, like uh, the um, uh, von Mises stresses need to be commu com computed by ISSM before the front tracking code can use it. So we need to in initialize that uh, on the ISSM side. Okay, uh, the last uh, thing for the coupling to consider is the coupling scheme. Um, as I said in the beginning, um, 
we want to solve this uh, scaling problem that the moving front core uh, introduces to ISSM. And for this, uh, we think that a parallel explicit scheme would give us the most flexibility. Um, so we can assign different numbers of CPUs to the different solvers. Um, um, right, but this could cause a problem when we are using discontinuous carving because this is basically from the large piece breaking off, basically a shock, and this could become uh, very unstable. So we may have to use implicit uh, or serial coupling. Um, yeah, last thing, um, I, we have done a small experiment for parallel coupling of uh, the ISSM cores. Um, usually, right now, ISSM is all the cores are in what's in precise language would be serial coupling. So they run one after the other. Um, we wanted to compare what happens when we do instead a parallel coupling of all the ISM cores. So th this does not include our new front tracking code yet. Uh, this is still with the old uh, moving front core. Um, this is a simulation of Kangalusuak Glacier in Greenland. It's like not a very uh, high resolution, high resolution yet. Um, on the top is the uh, serial coupling. On the bottom, the parallel coupling. Um, and as you can see. At the end of the simulation, this is the, the, the images on the right, um, there's a, there are small differences in the result. Um, so I have not done a quantitative analysis of this yet. So I don't know how exactly this compares to the general um, tolerances of the simulation. Um, and it's a large scale, a small scale problem. And it does not include the discontinuous carving yet. Um, but at least in this setup, um, the parallel coupling is stable, so we should be able to use that. Okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, right. this is our website if you want to learn more. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot for this very interesting talk uh, and the complex application. Uh, Miriam, do you want to? Uh, no, this was basically just to, uh, like I said, it uses, mostly uses uh, fixed time steps. So this is just the length of the simulation you want to do, like ha how the, the, time scheme, the time frame you want to cover. Um, this de depends how many iterations you, you need to do. And the, and the length of the iteration mostly depends on the resolution of the grid. So um, if you do a finer grid, you need to do smaller uh, um, time steps. So. Um, this would be parallel explicit in precise language, but, but it's not using precise actually. So we have done this in ISSM only, but it would be uh, parallel explicit. Um. Let me get back to maybe this one. Um, what's discontinuous? Um, basically, okay, so, so the um, velocity, the V is mostly con continuous. The uh, melting rate is continuous. This just slowly melts away. Uh, but the carving can be discontinuous. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in the front, like for ISM is, well, it probably could be done, but it's very compl uh, com complex, probably, uh, and it doesn't support that at the moment, and probably won't be able to fit that in there. Um, but the uh, external code, this is one of, one of the reasons that why we want to use an external code to be able to do something like that. Yes, almost, almost certainly. Like the. Um, the inversion for the carving rate could be expensive, but we don't know yet. But it's a, it's a two-dimensional problem and it's linear instead of the uh, um, stress balance solver, which is uh, three-dimensional and non-linear, so it's almost certainly going to be uh, the uh, cheaper participant.
further question? Yeah, basically. So, so the um, input would be the, like the, the, the parameters, so melting rate and carving rate, that we need to derive somehow, either from physics using some kind of carving and melting law, or using input from satellite images. Uh, yeah. And then the, the result of this would be the uh, uh, level set function, um, yeah, which implicitly defines where the front is. Yeah, we, well, we, we need at least uh, um, a satellite image for the initial state. Um, that's the, uh, and then uh, there are, uh, let me get to this, like two different approaches to getting, uh, to um, deriving this, uh, the velocity field for the transport equation. And one of them would be f just purely from physics. So com computing it during the simulation. And the other approach would be to use more satellite images that cover the whole uh, time of the simulation. I hope that answers the question. I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. I would say let's uh, finish the questions for now. And uh, thanks once more.